to River Reflections. You just saw a church service from River of Life, and that is the church that my husband Robert and I are the pastors and founders. And a lot of nice, loving Jesus people going to that church. If you're looking for a church home, please come check us out. Maybe we're it. Maybe this is where the Lord will lead you to. Last time I taught you, I was talking about we're in the last days. A lot of signs going on that were predicted. A lot of increase in the birth pains leading up to the coming of our Lord. I shared with you that Paul made it clear. Don't get all upset though because there's a couple things that have to happen. This is in Thessalonians before the Lord comes back again. One is that there's going to be a great falling away and I talked about that just the even from the time I was a child to now the kind of sin that's prevalent today that you hardly even heard of back when I was a kid particularly among church people. Now they say the church people divorce rate is about the same as the, that of the world. That's just, you could have never told me that when I was a kid that that would happen. You could have never told me that church people would ordain homosexual, uh, homosexual uh, leadership. You could have never told, I would not believe you, ever. You could not have told me of the prevalence of people right on TV and nationally and internationally known that it turns out later that they had an affair or died in a New York City hotel of a coke overdose. You couldn't have told me such things could happen. I would not have believed you. I remember at 10 years old, I heard about a pastor that had an affair with his organist, and I overheard it. And I was in the kitchen, and I overheard my mom and somebody mentioning it. And I'm like, what? A pastor did what? And I ran into the living room and sprawled out on the couch and just cried. I didn't even know the guy cried and cried and cried and cried and cried that such a thing could even happen in our church. It, it was my background, Christian Reform. I was just shocked beyond words that a pastor would do such a thing. When I was raised, a pastor in particular was just above reproach. We called him Domine. That was the Dutch word, I think, for Lord, like Dominus. Uh, and they were just, oh man, you just couldn't even imagine them hardly being um, normal like the rest of us you wonder what they even need a bathroom in their house for you know you just you just saw them as people that were so high and righteous in the good sense but now I think you know there's a lot of righteous ministers around I'm not saying there's not but there's a lot of sin being revealed too and doctrinal uh, deception and selfish ambition and uh, using the people to build one's own kingdom motivation that obviously looks like the Hollywood instead of being a servant. Just a whole lot of things you never thought would happen in the church, much less um, the kinds of things that are going on in the world are just overwhelming in terms of the wickedness. But the Lord said these things would happen. Things would get worse. There'd be perilous times before he came. But we have to get closer and closer to him and walk more and more in his spirit. Last time I did start in on Matthew 24, the first few a couple of verses. And those were, the, those were the verses where Jesus is taken by his disciples so that the disciples uh, in Jerusalem can point out, look at these buildings, these buildings, and these buildings in the temple. And at that point, Jesus said in verse 2, you know what? Um, this whole temple is going to just fall apart. Not st one stone is going to be left on another. It's exactly what happened in 70, 70 AD. And what makes it so interesting is that today there's a temple institute in Jerusalem that has everything they need, everything they need to build a temple in Jerusalem and plan to do it. Exactly where, I don't know. I mean, I know Jerusalem and I know general in general Mount Moriah, where it's supposed to be, Mount Zion, but you know what's there right now, so it's, it's a very interesting uh, thing to watch to see what's going to happen. The al Asqua, I'm probably not pronouncing that right, one of the major mosques of the Islam is on that very spot where the temple should be. So it's going to be very interesting to see it happen. But since 70 AD, this thing Jesus was predicting in Matthew 24, verse 2, until this very day, over 2,000 years later, the temple has never been rebuilt right there, ever. 
and people are planning on doing it. And Jesus said there'll come a day when the Antichrist is going to sit in the temple and call himself God. Well, there's got to be a temple for him to do that. So we're really going to know when that thing starts. Now we're really approaching. They're planning it. Um, don't know how they're going to do it. They got all the stuff. But when that starts happening, that's, things are really going to start to accelerate, I believe. But then the disciples are curious, just like we are. It says in Matthew 24, verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? Now he's talking about when the temple's going to, they're wondering when the temple's going to be destroyed, because that's when he just said. Well, that happened pretty quick after Jesus prophesies it. But then the next thing they ask is, what will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, it's a known fact that in the early church, they were always thinking it would be real soon. Uh, as a matter of fact, even in Acts, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead and the disciples knew there was going to be a kingdom that Jesus was going to rule and reign in, they thought, this is it. This is... This is going to be the end of the age as we know it. And all those uh, prophetic words about the son of David ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, setting up his kingdom. This must be it right now. But no, it wasn't. And it still hasn't been set in place. You know, I, I'm very sensitive about the words come to pass because the kingdom will never come to pass. Get the last two words, to pass. The kingdom will come to stay. So you're not going to say come to pass about the kingdom. It came to pass. No, it did not come to pass. It will be forever and ever, and it has not come yet. But the disciples were saying, what's the sign of your coming? They know from Zechariah. They knew the old covenant that as soon as uh, the Messiah came, he was going to come and destroy his enemies and set up a kingdom. They know that. It said that a king will rule. They knew that. They're saying, when's this going to happen? And then Jesus says, take, in verse 4, take heed that no man deceive you. For many will come in my name, saying, I'm Christ, and deceive many. This has already happened. Over time, there have been those that say, I'm it. Uh, I'm the Christ. I'm the Messiah. There are those that even say, uh, Jesus is coming in October of 1988. I knew that wasn't true. I knew it because of what it says has to happen before Jesus comes back. And I told everybody at my church, this is not going to ha happen. Then when this recent, maybe what, four years ago, uh, thing happened that this man said, and he had uh, billboards all over the country, Jesus is coming. I don't know what was that, then June or something, May or June, I forgot the exact date. All I know is on the date it was supposed to happen, I broke my arm. But... And that's why I remember because the tour guide, I was in New York City and the tour guide was just mocking that prophet because he's like, well, it hadn't happened yet. He's not here yet. Don't see him. Don't see him. He was just mocking any Christian that would have fallen for this thing. But it's happened. These aren't the only two times. These, are, these have been in my lifetime. But some people have in times past sold everything they own, got on top of some hill, and just waited for Jesus to come because somebody told them this is it. Well, it wasn't it. Jesus is saying, don't let anybody deceive you. Now, I want you to read on your own because I want to get through a Matthew 24. But it says in 2 Thessalonians, um, boy, I always forget what, what chapter that's in. Uh, it's in Second Thessalonians that the Antichrist will come along and deceive many, and he's even going to do it with signs and wonders. You know what? I'm actually going to want to look that up, so I want to tell you about the, um, the verse reference because it said that all those who don't receive a love of truth will be deceived, and I want you to love truth enough to study this out. Uh, you might have to look it up for yourself in your own concordance, but I will try a minute and see if my handy phone will get it for me. You'd think I wouldn't be like this on a TV program, wouldn't you? Well, you might have to look up for yourself. Let's see. I'm going to try love of truth here. Okay. There it is. Yay. Okay. As long as I'm here... Let me go ahead and, and read it. Talking about this one that's going to deceive many. Jesus said, don't let anybody deceive you. Now, he's telling us ahead of time through his spirit, through Paul, that 
And he's talking about the thing that I talked about in the last program, the Antichrist setting himself up as God. Second Thessalonians 2, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because, and this is the part I really want you to hear, they receive not the love of truth that they might be saved. Check this out now. You know what the punishment is for not loving truth? God will send you a strong delusion. He'll send you a lie to believe. It says in verse 11, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them a, a strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in on righteousness. So during the time of the Antichrist, people that didn't love the truth, people that were not grounded in the word, didn't want to hear it, didn't want to grow up into Christ, God will literally cause you to believe the Antichrist. And therefore you will, according to Revelation, take on the mark of the beast, his mark, in order to buy or sell. And therefore you will be tossed into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Why? Where does it start? I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to listen to anybody teach the word. I don't want to go and see if it's true what they're saying. I don't want to seek out God. I don't want to diligently seek him. I don't want to see who the creator is. I like the creature better. I like me better. I'm going to live for me. I'm going to live for me, me, me. I'm going to eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, and I'm going to be just the smartest guy. And I don't need God. Everybody that thinks like that, God will let you believe lies. And in the end, it said right there, you will be damned. Oh, God's a God of love. He's good all the time. He won't damn anybody. Yeah, he's a God of love. He's kind. He's forgiving. He's long-suffering. But he's also a God of wrath and justice. And he already paid the price of the wrath that should come upon me by having the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, take on all of his wrath. That's where wrath, justice, mercy, peace, love all converged all converged and those that believe that jesus paid for their sins and took on the anger of god towards sin will be saved and those of you that says a bunch of hogwash you will be damned and you will end up in fire you know what that's not god's heart for you that's not mine that's not anybody's heart for you but it's your choice whether or not you have a love of truth and seek god don't be deceived jesus said Here's what's happening even now, Matthew 24, verse 6. And you're going to hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you don't get troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. You know what? Don't be praying that there's never going to be another war. It's just not going to happen like that. There's going to be wars. Jesus just said. He just said it. There's going to be wars. You know, I was thinking about that today, how people want to say, God can do anything. God could keep mankind from ever having another war. Oh, you know, conceivably God could, but the fact is he's got a plan, just like his plan to put the sin on Jesus Christ. And Jesus is in the garden, and he's just weeping. He's sweating drops of blood. He's in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, Father, if there's any other way for you to do this, in other words, for you to take away the sin of mankind, uh, any other way, please take this cup from me. It's, it's, it's horrific. And there wasn't another way. That was God's plan. So you couldn't have people all praying like Peter's like, oh, don't go to Jerusalem if they're going to kill you. And then Jesus said, get thee behind me. Satan, you're savoring the things of man, not of God. God has a plan. Just be ready when all these things happen. It says in Matthew 24, verse 7, nation will rise against nation, kingdoms against kingdoms. There'll be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. You know that, that plague I referred to of Ebola? I mean, that's not the first plague that's hit the, the earth for sure, but we got that one looking at us right now, and that thing could race and race all over the place um, if it doesn't, we don't figure out a way to deal with it. And it's, it is fearful. It is a fearful thing, the kinds of things the earth are going through. In verse 8, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. This is the part that's really difficult uh, because we love to be loved by people we love. But it says, then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, which means pressured, persecuted, troubled, and shall kill you. That's what it says. Read it. Matthew 24, verse 8. Don't go around confessing, I will never die um, through being killed 
uh, because of persecution. If ISIS comes here and wants to behead everybody, God will make me invisible, or God will have them see 10,000 angels surrounding me, and I'll escape. I could never possibly die through being persecuted. Well, it is true that there have been missionaries that were persecuted, that later on the, the people that, the natives who fled and did not kill them said it was because they saw you know, what turned out to be thousands of angels surrounding their um, house compound. That has happened. People have been saved from death. Daniel was delivered from death. Then all kind of people have been delivered from death. But you hear the uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs and different stories. A whole lot of people have been killed, too. It's part of the plan. It's part of the plan. Right here, it is prophesied, and they shall kill you. Shall kill you. That's not going to be fun. Although... If we've got, like Jesus, the joy set before us, and therefore we endure because we see the invisible, at least if we've received the love of truth and we know what reality we're moving into from glory to glory, from this earthen body to the presence of the Lord, there's a whole different reaction to being killed. I feel so sorry for suicide bombers that have got this ridiculous lie. They're going to get 70 virgins. I keep thinking with those young bucks, they're going to go through those 70 virgins in two months. They're not going to be virgins anymore. Now what? Now what do you get to have after that? Think about it. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just saying thinking about it. Think about it. And the fact is, people that, it says over in the epistle to John, people that don't have the Son, don't have the Father, that means you're not in Christ. That means you're not even going to see heaven if you're not walking in Christ. Only through Christ. There's only one name under the heaven to be saved, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. Period. Don't kid yourself and say we got the same religion as Islam. How can we have the same religion as Islam when Allah has no son? Our God has a son who he sent to die for us. It's a radically different religion. If you die for Islam, you are going to hell. Period. You know what? And I believe there's been some people that truly have been deceived and their intentions are, they believe in them. They're honorable to them. But they're deceived. Absolutely deceived. Please, if you're into Islam, no matter what it takes, if you have to go to a bookstore and read a Bible in a corner in order to get initiated into the New Covenant and what the Bible says about Jesus, do whatever you can to learn Jesus. But anyway... Um, you're going to be killed. Some of us are going to be killed. And it says over here in verse 10, and many shall be offended. Why are you offended? Because you've always been taught. God is good all the time. And in your brain that means he'll never allow anybody to get beheaded for the sake of gospel. Nobody's going to go through anything because God is good all the time. Listen, you're going to be utterly offended if you've been taught on truths. You know, Jeremiah was prophesying of how the Babylonians were going to come in and destroy Jerusalem. And for 70 years, the Israelis or the people of Judah would be in captivity in Babylon, on and on and on. And he didn't do a thing wrong. He was a godly man. And he himself went through some things. Both when he was prophesying, they threw him in a pit. And when the, um, you can't tell me he was all happy when they burned down the temple. That wasn't a happy day for Jeremiah. Jeremiah loved the Lord and his sacrifices and the thing of the Lord. Don't tell me that people that love God and are walking right are going to see anything or go through anything. It's a simple lie. It's lie. It says at the end of uh, 9, um, You'll be hated of all nations for my sake. And I looked at that word hate, and all of us can feel when we go into a situation where we're not welcome. We almost think, oops, what am I doing here? What made me think it was a good place to go? And I thought somebody invited me. I guess they didn't consult anybody else because I literally feel like persona non grata. And hatred means... Um, despise, loathe, they have hostility intensely and aversion. I often think if I cause somebody else to feel literally repulsed because they don't like me at all, I really want to do them the favor of getting away from around them because that doesn't feel good to me either. I don't know what it would be about me, but it could happen. I mean, people just rub each other the wrong way. Well, in this case, they're talking about, sometimes, um, they're talking about 
Christians would be despised and hated. And again, 50 years ago, I wouldn't have believed that. When I was 18 years old, you couldn't have told me that because it seemed like we were the majority and anybody that wasn't a Christian, they actually got quiet about it. In fact, I had a girlfriend at Kelvin College who told me, confided in me, and I didn't even know it was a confidence because I figured whatever you believe, you believe, so you've thought it through, so be who you are, even if you're wrong. If you're a Buddhist, you're a Buddhist. Just say so. Don't tiptoe around about it. Just say who you are and what you believe. Well, she told me she was an atheist. And I told one of our other close friends what she had told me. It never occurred to me it was some big secret if that's what she was. And she was so angry with me that I had told another person she was an atheist. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, back in that day, if you did, weren't a believer, then people looked down at you and thought, what's wrong with you? Why wouldn't you believe? But more and more, you watch TV, you watch these folks mock, mock Christians, Christians' belief. In fact, I heard somebody um, mock Cameron. What's that guy's name? He made quite a few movies now, uh, christian theme kind of movies. He might have been behind this latest Louis Cage Left Behind thing, maybe, I think. But he's a Christian, strong Christian in Hollywood, and this one a ha 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 commentator was talking about him and said for Halloween he's handing out tracks and I'm thinking yeah people need to know they don't need to be into Halloween it's all called a bunch of demonic activity and the most loving thing you can do is hand somebody some literature about Halloween on Halloween if they come to your door and uh, you can even say, if you want some candy, come back next week. We can just enjoy each other. But in none do with no Halloween. I'm not going to get involved in the spirit of Halloween. And I'm saying, that guy just laughed and laughed. And the audience was laughing. How can anybody be so stupid um, to hand out a track on Halloween? Well, back when my son is 8 and he's 42 now, um, it's exactly what we did to the kids. We told them about the Lord and about the Lord's disgust with Halloween. Speaking of getting out of Babylon, that's one of the first things you need to get out of the the other thing is Christmas is coming up. Get away from Santa Claus. Uh, get away from all that junk. But I say these words. I know there's people that I've taught, and I see their sites on Facebook, and their kids are all dressed up like Halloween costumes. I'm thinking, what part didn't you understand? I even shared the encyclopedia, a totally unbiased, objective source, and they read it. Read about Halloween, the origins and the practices in your encyclopedia or go to the library. Don't just take my word for stuff. Study it out. But all I'm saying to you, when you start to stand for righteousness in this world, you become hated. People mock you. They mock you. And they would literally, if you were up for a certain job and the whole staff and environment was new age and secular humanists, they don't want you around. They do not want you around talking about truth and righteousness and the ways of your creator. They don't want to hear it, and it's getting worse and worse. And Jesus predicted that. Jesus, and you can read on your own, John 15, 17 to 25. Read that on your own. Jot it down. Read it on your own, because Jesus said, just like he was hated, we've been hated. Don't be believing all those people on TV. Yes, God can give us di divine favor for his purposes. That's true. But again... We somehow got stuck in the attitude, we're only going to experience favor. No, when it's the purpose of God to give us favor, he will. He's perfectly capable of giving a Daniel or a Solomon or whatever, Joseph in the Bible, favor or anybody else, favor, to go talk to the president about something and be heard, favor. But you know what? Just as much as promised is they hated me, they're going to hate you too. Why is it you don't get the whole story? Why is it you just want to talk about the pastels and you don't want to get into the browns and the grays and the blacks of reality? It's all part of the canvas, not just the pretty little pinks and yellows and uh, powder blue. That's not the only part of the canvas of life in Christ. There's some pretty dark clouds going on too that we have to navigate through and be his soldiers says, many shall be offended, betray one another, hate one another. <coughs> Even says, is, did I skip it or something? Uh, in another passage, maybe, maybe it's in Luke 13, that even those members of your own household, in other words, people you thought would always love you, when it comes right down to the wire of them standing with Christ and being persecuted and maybe even killed, or not being able to buy and sell because they aren't going to take on the mark of the beast, but they changed their mind because they're more about hunger like Esau was than about 
serving God, even if it means they have to love not their life unto death, like the Bible speaks of overcomers in Revelation. So because you're trying to st uh, stand strong in Christ and they're falling all over the place, they will hate you. Have you ever known a, a backslidden Christian yet who wants to hang around with a Christian who's walking in Christ 24-7 and the other person is obviously wrong, tossing some pride, they don't want to admit they're wrong, and then they start to point a finger at you in order to keep the finger at going at their own sorry state. In the last days, it'll, it'll accelerate, and we will be betrayed by people that love the world more than they love God. The fear of man is bigger than the fear of God. Uh, verse 11, many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Now, you've heard me to allude a lot to the, the false pr uh, words about uh, peace and safety and favor and riches and, oh, just all these wonderful things you're going to experience. And before anything ever bad happens to you, Jesus is going to come and snatch you out. That's false prophecy. Along with that is the false idea that sin is not sin. God's grace is so big that he understands we're sinners. And if we sin, we don't have to say sorry because he's already paid for that sin. He knows. He knows. Um, his grace is so big. No, 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 no. No. His grace is big. His kindness is big. But you need to have a heart of repentance, a heart, a contrite heart of brokenness, a constant awareness that we're in a battle between good and evil. And then when we mess up, tell the Lord about it. Let him cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But don't presume upon his grace. That is part of the false prophecies that um, have arrived. But he said, he that endures to the end will be saved. I'm going to skip just to allude to 15. That's where Jesus talks about the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet uh, Daniel. Stand in the holy place. And that's what's spoken of uh, in that Thessalonian passage where the Antichrist stands in the holy place and calls him him uh, self God. And then it says after that um, if you go over to 27, it says, after that, the Lord's going to come. And it's not going to be secret. It's going to be like lightning filling the sky. You're going to see him. Every eye will see him. Every knee will bow. But endure, endure, endure until the very end of this age. So when the Lord comes, he, he finds you not wanting a thing concerning him. In Jesus' name.